name is Sherry, and welcome to the Gauntlet Podcast. I'm joined by my co-host, Lowell. Hello! And we have with us this month, Jamie, who has an awesome new project to talk to. Who's also a co-host. This is a very special triple co-host episode. <laughs> no, I'm so excited for this. The stars have aligned. Thank you so much. <laughs> for our first segment, each of us is going to go through the RPGs we played in April and May, and we're going to talk in depth about what we play on the Gauntlet calendar. So, Lowell, how was your April and May gaming? It wasn't bad. I've kind of dialed back a little bit from running on the Gauntlet, and I've got a chance to play a little bit more. So, Off Gauntlet, 13th Age, Hearts of Ulin, Star Trek Adventures Express, and then uh, Declan Oblige. And then on Gauntlet, this Brindlewood Bay mashup with hearts of Ulin that just started that which has a cool name right i remember the campaign has a cool oh it's name. A, I, I called it like numberless secrets is yeah. the name of the, the campaign nice, for it. Nice. so i'll get some new role books in that and i'll probably talk about that again in the future and then the veil inheritance which is the most recent version of the veil the one that's forthcoming it's been gone through kickstarter it's gonna be coming out which is kind of a cowboy bebop inspired one and then Microscope, the little game I wrote, Arcana Inamata, Kingdom 2E, second edition. And then the game I want to talk about is Ryutama. I've only played a couple of sessions of this, but I wanted to say, say a few impressions because I don't think we've talked about it recently on the podcast. And it was an indie darling a while back, and I think it's still a, a really, really cool game. It's Natural Fantasy Roleplay is the subtitle. And, of course, this is a Japanese game by Atsuhiro Okada that was translated by Matt Sanchez and Andy Kitkowski. We had Andy on the program like three years ago mm. or so for another project. But this is a fantasy RPG that visually to me looks like somebody looked at Final Fantasy Tactics and was like, oh, I want to do all those characters but in like a real world kind of thing. It's got a very distinctive look. In the game, you play out a group of travelers who are on a trip and encountering things on the way. They can be monsters in combat, but they can also be problem solving. A little bit like how the One Ring and some other games do journeys now. There's a daily travel check for conditions and move along and incidents occur. And a Pucket who's running this has a little hex crawl map that he's made up in hex kit that looks really nice. So very excited about it. Let me talk about what I dug in just the, the two sessions. Again, two sessions impressions worth of this game. For me, the feel is what really sells it. When you look through it and you read it, you're like, oh... This has its own nice, definitive atmosphere. You've got classes like the farmer, the healer, the hunter, etc. Beyond that, the whole premise of why you're on the road is this idea that in this world, it's expected that every person will at some point take a journey, travel somewhere and back, and the society and cultures and cities and things like that, they expect that. So if somebody goes on this journey, this kind of once in a lifetime pilgrimage, other people will take up their slack and they can come back to their lives after that. There's kind of a lovely concept there. It's also good because I love the idea of a travel game. I adore that. I adore running that in fantasy games. And I love games that do that in a way that isn't supremely mechanized. Like, I liked Mutineer Zero, which has sort of the sector crawl to it, and it was fun, but there's a lot of real mechanical bits to it. I like getting a, a little bit out of the way. Forbidden Lands has some mechanical stuff at end-of-day things, but then has RP during the playtime in between. So I do, I do dig this. It almost strikes me now that I'm thinking about that the sort of the phase of resolving conditions and the daily checks and stuff is almost like downtime or an approach roll from forge in the dark yeah mm -hmm. and now i'm thinking about how you could do a road game oh, in oh. forge in the dark riatama's also fun for all the little color bits in it it's got a very distinctive specific 
world with specific ethos, special skills, and the magic. There are these seasonal magics. You can get general magics, but like the seasonal magics, I have autumn. So like one of my spells that I start with is I'm able to summon a pile of leaves. That is my spell. I don't know what I'm going to do with that, but I love it. The other spell that I took is the ability to make any kind of food thing into jam <gasps> as a preserve. Wow. I want that which has, spell in real life. <laughs> I mean. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but like I started out by making fish jelly. Oh, no. Uh, and... <laughs> <laughs> so it's a great little color thing there. It's got a very simple, basic die system in that. Most tasks have two attributes of your four that you're rolling. Your attributes define a die type like D4, D6, D8, or even D10. You roll the two attributes together versus a task number. Real simple in that sense. And I like that. It was one of the things I had when I first read through the game, I couldn't quite grasp what was happening with that. And that's something I'll come back to in just a moment. One of the other things I adored is that when we made up characters, the other three players all made very old characters. I've been a farmer, or I've raised these children, or I have this, and or my husband's dead, all of these things. And so I was able to make up a very young character who has none of that and thinks all the other characters are like super old. <laughs> Ancient. <laughs> yeah, they're all very contemplative. And my character's like, yes! <laughs> like, I can go get herbs. I can do that. <laughs> herbs that's what i do <laughs> and i've been playing that character very much that way and that's been fun one last thing i want to say is if you can get a copy of the book the book is gorgeous it's a beautiful hardcover it's really lovely nice illustrations it has a very distinct feel to it it's one of those rpg books where you can feel the craft when you're looking through it things i'm a little bit less sure of and again two sessions so take this with a grain of salt. I haven't seen combat yet. We haven't had a fight in the two sessions that we've played, which I love. But it also means that I kind of don't know how combat works, except that looking through the book, it looks like you've got zones and order and stuff, and it looks a little crunchy. So I'm going to be very curious to see how that feels. One of the other things is that this is a game that very much wants to lean into classic fantasy tropes it has an extensive money gear and encumbrance set of rules and of course because you're traveling it kind of needs to have that but all these things have different costs and they do different benefits and you've got track of them and stuff and i get why you have that in there i understand it i mean it fits absolutely but for me even playing it a little ironically it gets a little much I will say, when I have to go and buy my equipment for my characters, my eyes roll back in my head. <laughs> it was fun. It was amusing. But at the same time, we're also going, okay, this is your limit. And now I got to buy a bunch of bags and I got to calculate this out or I'm encumbered. So uh, not my favorite thing. I'm also unsure, looking through the book, how much there is there. By which I mean, how much support is there for the GM. The GM has some really interesting tools in that the GM also has a character. They play a dragon. They choose and you kind of choose a dragon and it levels up and you get blessings that you can give benedictions to the players. And that's kind of cool and there's some interesting stuff there. But looking through, it doesn't seem to me like there's a lot of guidance of here are interesting incidents on the road i mean here are the things you could encounter here are the kinds of challenges that you could have that feels a little thin on the ground a little less supported than i would have expected for something like this last thing i'll say is i'm really glad i'm playing this with somebody running who knows the rules because i've had ria thomas since it first came out i backed it i got the copy and i have bounced off these rules three or four times yeah. trying to read through trying to get how it works i don't know why when i go to play it's not that complicated but there's something about the way the rules are presenting themselves and the order of information that 
isn't clicking with me. Yeah, yeah. I feel the same because I've been trying to run a game, but there's just something about it that makes my eyes go a little... So it's great that Puckett's running. That's fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. And he's doing a great job and it's a great table. So that's a real delight. I guess my overall takeaway is that this game is pretty neat. I like this kind of story. It seems to me like the game is doing a good job of supporting that kind of play. And I'm really happy I'm getting a chance to do it. It's one of the games that I have. For those of you who don't know, one of the things we have on the Gauntlet Gaming Calendar, we have our Slack for people who've played. And we have a channel on the Slack to say, hey, I'd love to play this. And oftentimes, GMs will step up and and put those games out there. So Ryutama is one of those games that I got by going, please. (laughs) Okay, well, I guess I will talk about what games I played this last month. Off Gauntlet, I played 13th Age. I played Hearts of Woodland Supernatural Playbooks, which is the favorite Favorite version of Hearts of Ulin for me lately. <laughs> Played Star Trek Adventures Express and Decline Oblige, uh, which is in playtest and very strange and wondrous. And I'm looking forward to getting back to more of that. But on Gauntlet, I got to play The Veil Inheritance, which is in, I believe, late playtest. There is Star Wars Saturday Neon City Overdrive. Neon City Overdrive is not in playtest. It is a very clever little system and you need to look it up up. It's on um, DTRBG, I know for sure. And then there's Hearts of Olin, the Brindlewood Bay mashup that Lowell is running. And also get to play I Hunt again, which I'm thrilled with. But today I'm going to talk about the Vale Inheritance because I think it is almost ready to go onto the printer now. So it should be available soonish. And essentially what the Veil Inheritance is, is it's Fraser Simon's further fractalization of the Veil, kind of taking back the playbooks and all of those things. It's not that he's changed that thing. He's added another set of nuanced playbooks to that sort of sense of what the Veil can be. And this time Inheritance is concentrating on playbooks that are about identity first and foremost. The playbooks are kind of ominous, and they're far future. Each of them has an imprint purpose because you, dear player, have been designed for a purpose. You've been given or developed conditioning that helps you cope with the things you're driven to do. You have an imprint move, which is a move from any of the Veil's previous playbooks, which suggests that you have an origin separate than what you're doing now. And all of this is sort of the starting point of defining yourself, like clearly a constructed self and not constructed under your own power. Your relationships are framed as obligations and they often center around you using your imprinted abilities to have helped or harmed people around you. And the one thing you know is that you used to be someone different, but it's hard to tell which parts of now you are really you. So that's kind of the central set of themes. So this is a very tightly themed, like all the playbooks have identity very foremost as their theme. But then within that, there are other themes. So I found that as we were playing it, what worked for me is that the Veil's always succeeded at playbooks that coax that thematic play. These are around identity very firmly on the idea of what makes you, you, those ideas about identity. And the playbooks, I'm just going to run through them real quick so you get a sense of what it is. So I think one of the playbooks that tells you right away is the shepherd, which is a pilot who's tied to their ship. So you are sort of part of the ship in some ways, at least functionally. The clipper, who they erase people, their data, their memories, their digital footprints, even their lives. So they're assassins, essentially, of lives and identity. There's a linker who they say oh, finds that which does not wish to be found, but they're just extraordinarily good trackers, except that, of course, they have trouble finding their own identity. And then the mirror, they take over other identities And the Sparrow, who's a builder and repairman who knows machines and signals like other people know people. And then finally, the custodian who's been entrusted with a secret that they have to keep. So they know something that they're trying to keep from other people. So everything is this very tightly, here's an idea about an identity, about the idea of of mission and identity, I think, being tied together. And it ends up being pretty intense. The other thing is, is all the playbooks are very much designed for mission-based play. If you look at it, it's it's a group. 
of, you know, people who are going to go out there and get a job done, right? You, you're going to be a merc. You're going to be that kind of thing. This is all about get out there and do a thing, not all of you sitting around in your apartments feeling sad about things. You're <laughs> yeah, a, a, a little a little more so than regular Vail. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, yeah, Vail is yeah. super open, right? Because I remember the conversation open. used to be cyberpunk between the veil and the sprawl and it was like well if you want mission based you go sprawl right yeah so, so this sounds super interesting yeah if you want identity based mission based stuff you're gonna go the veil inheritance yeah i think the thing that always works for me with the veil is that of course you have the emotion based stats so you call for a stat the best fits with how and why you're doing what you're doing and again the here the emotions really fit into that sense of identity too because Everything gets like super personal. Everything you do is super personal in the game. So it's really cool the way that it's been designed so that the questions foremost in the play about identity kind of goes in these paranoid directions and also curious directions where the players are trying to figure out why and when and who and how they are. It is an amazing little set of designs just for really bringing that theme out and underlining it over and over again. And and indeed, the play was incredibly intense. It starts out that we clearly all have stuff to do, but the desire to figure out who you are or what your past was and how it ties to what you're doing now, it means that it's really hard to get through a mission without going, okay, I'm going to have to set this off to the side because it's more important that I go and figure this out. So there's like lots of things pulling at you and you're, you're not being your best self, but you're having a great play experience. If there's anything that I'm less sure about with it, the inheritance playbooks themselves have moves that are more of the thing. So in essence, you almost need to treat your playbook as I'm going to take my main move and I'm going to take maybe one or two other moves from this playbook. But to define the rest of myself, I'm either going to run this down into a super deep hole of these abilities that I have, or I'm going to say, no, I figured out the part of being a clipper that I am. And now I'm going to go and bring in more of like my discovered self. And you go and you get playbook moves from other veil playbooks to define that self, maybe as someone you've made yourself now, or as sort of strange memories from your past life that are coming back up. But the playbooks are very narrow. (laughs) For me, at least that creates a really interesting contradiction because on the one hand, you want to play long with this game. Yeah. Like you want to have more than four sessions. You want to have eight sessions or more. Like the way the characters interact, the way they breathe, all of that is really rewarded by long play. But at the same time, the kind of moves you're getting do double up in some ways. And so you can feel like, okay, well... This time is happening, but I'm not kind of getting the cool advancement like I want to. Yeah, you feel like you have, oh, it's this very narrow, different version of the same thing I can do already. But it makes sense if you had just chosen that one and you go, that's how this ability works for my character. And of course, the thing is, the game is very clear about using these other playbooks to build those other parts of yourself. So it's not a horrible thing, but it is a thing that you aren't going to buy your whole playbook unless you want to be the uber clipper. Or whatever, which some people may want to do. Fair enough. (laughs) Yeah. Because the veil is thematic, and this thematic is very, very clear, and it's kind of done at every level, that it is something that you are bumping into constantly. That might be a bit much for some people if they just want to, you know, get around, play a little mission-based things, you know, make some money, talk about what they're going to buy, get some cool additions. There's no avoiding your your strange past to the question wow, of identity. Wow, that's so cowboy bebop though, isn't it? Right? <laughs> yeah. Like they I try their best is. Yeah, to just they... do the mission, but their past keeps sneaking up on them. Oh, yeah, and this is yeah. this is like totally that. This is that it is, is so like cool, though. so engineered for that. And of course, I was playing with Gauntlet players. They were all in. And it was super Mm -hmm. fun and even super intenser. That's my theory. (laughs) Um, It was great. But we got to do the thing with uh, spiking our emotions out, which is the thing of going, whenever someone goes, oh, you'll use emotions or pick your own stat, you'll you'll just use the same best one all the time. Hey, we don't do that usually. We're like all very searching. What what is my, how am I feeling right now? But then the (laughs) other thing is... 
Because it's such a joy. It's such a joy to say, I'm so doing good. this so because good. I'm angry. You know, yeah. this is why this comes. Uh-huh. I mean, it that really just makes sense. So it, yeah, it allows you to like explicate your character all the time. And it makes you like really think about it more. But the other thing is, is we spiked up. So that's the, what the system does is if someone uses something too much or if they happen to be Patrick and they take every move in the book that allows them to spike out emotions. Oh, so, Patrick. <laughs> yes, Patrick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he had like, he spiked up all of us. In one grand move, and then like he was spiked in three emotions simultaneously. I was like, I didn't even think that was possible. I never. Yep. Wow! Yeah. I need to go back. And I need to watch the videos. Oh my yes, gosh, it's hilarious! Should, because as you watch oh him do gosh. it, he all does that within about fifteen minutes of each other. So mm-hmm. uh, it was pretty awesome. We were all in some kind of shape for a while there. It was good times, but we had really active players who were really leading into the system. So I'm pretty sure that the system is going to give you that intense play. That there's going to be those those pieces that are sitting out there for the players to grab onto and i think that's awesome but i don't know if that's what everyone's thinking about when they're thinking about cyberpunk so you do mm-hmm. want to have that talk with your players before you play it right right so. even though i think it's like an essential really fun part of cyberpunk it's not what immediately comes to mind right exactly right. Yeah. exactly but it's awesome we had a lot of fun it's super well engineered in a way that doesn't feel dry at all it seems natural when you're doing it so my takeaway is this is fraser simon's doing with the veil what he does best and he's picked identity as the theme that you're going to definitely have first and foremost and worked these variations on it so that you are going to have some kind of crazy mission-based cyberpunk game where all of the evo things are first and foremost and i think cowboy bebop is a really good way to put it The Between is coming. The Between is a tabletop role-playing game about a group of mysterious monster hunters in Victorian-era London. These hunters learn about monsters and killers throughout the city and conduct investigations or hunts in order to neutralize them. Over time, they become aware of the plans of a criminal mastermind who is pulling the strings behind the scenes. They will eventually be forced to confront this criminal mastermind in order to save Queen and Country. The Between is directly inspired by the TV show Penny Dreadful, but also takes inspiration from British horror classics, the works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, Pulp Era Media, The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, and From Hell. The Between comes with the core rules, seven playbooks, nine scenarios or threats, a mastermind sheet, reference sheets, and a supplement called London at Night, The Unseen. You'll be able to get the Between in PDF form via the Gauntlet Patreon in late May. Just go to patreon.com forward slash gauntlet. The Between will be available on DriveThruRPG in June. Can you hear the footsteps in the shadows? Can you smell the metal tang of blood on the air? Can you feel the veil between worlds slipping away with each heartbeat? It's London Calling. So, for our second segment, we're going to talk to Jamie about a project that they are working on. So, Jamie, tell us. I'm so excited to talk about this. We are bringing Once More Into the Void to Kickstarter. It's a huge deal for me because I've been working on my games for a while now. Everyone at the Gauntlet is aware of all the playtests. And Once More Into the Void got playtested on the Gauntlet a few times so that helped towards this point so basically once more into the void is about a captain and their crew we were big damn heroes of the galaxy we were comrades we were family the tragedy struck and the family fell apart there's a shared past full of shame trespasses and secrets and the captain left us when we needed them most so our greatest enemy has returned and we face a galaxy-wide threat The captain must get the crew together one last time and regain the loyalty of that crew. It's just like old times, so will we go once more into the void? That's basically the premise. It has a very specific premise. One of the players is going to be that captain and everyone else is going to play the crew. The touchstones of Once More Into the Void for sci-fi fans, I'm sure it really came across 
fairly easily, but the touchstones are Star Trek Picard and Mass Effect 2. So Star Trek Picard was what birthed this whole game in the first place. And Star Trek Picard focuses on themes of history and failure and redemption, a journey of forgiveness and reclaiming a future from a broken past. I was so inspired by the sense of time and history that was present in the series. I realized there's so many sci-fi shows I love where, especially Star Trek, right, because of the way it was built back then, they didn't want too much of a sense of continuity between the episodes. They wanted you to be able to like jump in and watch any episode and not get lost Mm because it was a different time back then. And so when I was watching Star Trek Picard, I was just so taken aback watching Picard just really grapple with all of that history. It was so moving and how it colored his actions and perspective. It was a really fresh take on numerous sci-fi tropes. So I really, really loved it. And when I was watching it, there was a moment when Picard, so this is a slight spoiler. I won't go into too much detail just in case, but Picard goes to recruit a former member of the crew who who worked with Picard when they were still part of Starfleet. And as the actors were like playing out the scene, I was like, wow, this is so good. But also, is this PPTA or is this fate? <laughs> like I was trying to like figure out the mechanics. I was like, you know, it's going back and forth really quickly. And it's really mainly focused on them expressing themselves as characters. I think this is like the Firebrands framework. So I think this is like prompts and roleplay moments and questions that are going back and forth between the players. So I'll get into the system in a bit, but that's basically what inspired the entire game. But as I was working on it, so the first version of Once More Into the Void, I wrote it in a fugue state. Like I wrote it from scratch and designed and laid out all at the same time, got the art for it, put it on itch in like eight days. So I don't do that anymore. I'm much more, uh, I like to think. <laughs> like I do, I Actually, do that no, you still do that. <laughs> <laughs> you just put it on your Patreon. <laughs> kind of true trying to i remember when you did this when you came up with this when you were like oh i should do a game like this and then the, i turned around and the game was done <laughs> exactly <laughs> i was just so inspired though like uh like it got to the point where i knew it was i would go to sleep thinking about the game and i would wake up in mid thought hmm. like in mid design thought i knew i was working on the game in my sleep so when i would sit on the keyboard it would just go whoosh, just flow out basically as i was writing it my love for mass effect started to really come through because there were like there are a lot of great similarities in different sci-fi shows like these archetypes that we draw upon right and mass effect is easily one of my favorite video games of all time and as i was working on this i i was reaching towards like a natural conclusion like what the last part what is the culminating arc of the game and it worked towards something that's like a suicide mission where everyone has to face the most dire odds, which was a really great part of Mass Effect 2. There's a really strong mechanic in Once More Into the Void that's based on gaining loyalty and seeing if it will be enough to see you through in the final mission, just like the video game, basically. You're right. And the other thing is, is that because Firebrands is so about the scenes Mm -hmm. and that character play Mm -hmm. that it's the natural way to do it. There's nothing in your way between your sense of what's good about these stories and what you're going to be doing in the game. Yeah, I kind of liked the idea that it was something everyone was aware of that they would have to take on in the end and it would color everything else. It was definitely the hope. And I went with the Firebrands framework. It's one of my favorite systems for a game. And it was first created by Megway and Vincent Baker when they made Mobile Frame Zero Firebrands and The King is Dead later. But it was Firebrands that sparked that entire idea. What's really great about Firebrands is it's a casual party game. You can pick it up and play. You don't need a GM and you don't need to prep. So it's really great for beginners. The first time I played this game was literally at a party. My friend just like took out the stack of playbooks and was like, do you want to play Firebrands? It's a it's a mecha game, Jamie. Like he knew it was enough to like hook me in and go like, yes, I'll be here for the mix. It's also great for veterans though, because it focuses so much on role play and it really pushes you because you don't have 
other things to distract you, other mechanics. It's really just about interacting with other characters over and over again. So Firebrand games are also great for epilogues, prologues, or side stories in an ongoing campaign. I actually know some people who were playing like a sci-fi campaign and then they use Once More Into the Void, like they would use either it as a whole or they would just take chunks of the mini game, slightly rewrite them so that it fits into what they're doing. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It was super fun. I heard of someone who did it for an impulse drive campaign. So that was Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, so so I encourage people to like take a look at it. Yeah, yeah. And see what they can hack and put together. So it's super, super fun. So a significant change I made in Once More to the Void is normally in Firebrand framework games you have factions that you can choose to be a part of, but what I wanted to do was instead you choose a playbook, right? You choose a specific archetype, you choose a character, because everything is so focused on relationships with each other, mainly with the captain and what happened in the past, and on your intimate stories together. So the playbooks are, you have the captain, a leader who must grapple with the burden of redemption, the veteran, an old-timer who must prove they still have what it takes, The reformed, a traitor on the run from those who serve the void. The believer, an innocent who has always dreamed of being a hero. The broken, a cynic who is consumed by vengeance and pain. And finally, the strange, an outsider who is pure marvel, wonder, and beauty. And my favorite bit is like the playbooks have a very specific set of like emotional themes. And then it's fun Mm -hmm. seeing like who you can slot in. So for example, if you're going to play one of the best characters in the world, Garrus Vakarian from Mass Effect, you can easily slot Garrus into the veteran where, you know, he's a cop and he's been around for a while, but you could also put him into the broken if you wanted him to be a more like, I was forced to do what I did as Archangel in Mass Effect 2. And, you know, if you wanted to go down a darker route and stay there, you could do that. It's a lot of fun. And the thing is, Firebrands is known mainly for its mini games, right? So when you think Firebrands, you think mini games. Each mini game frames a scene or a collection of scenes, and each mini game has its own simple rules for the most part. The mini games provide roleplay prompts, interesting choices that affect narrative and characters in interesting ways. There are lots of laser sharp questions that I put in there that really help push the scenes into evocative and compelling directions. And really, it was from my time learning how to ask questions as a GM that I applied to the game. I actually had someone recently who said, I became a better GM when I read through Once More Into the Void and I saw all these like really like intense questions, which I learned from the gauntlet. So I learned a lot (laughs) of these like really intense, interesting questions from GMs. I learned like the more specific and the more like spark, right? If you could spark like interest or creativity in the question, then the more awesome the answer is. So in Once More Into the Void, I made sure that the questions really helped each player focus on what they could bring out in the scene. And it really worked out well in playtest and in playing the game and seeing others play the game. And I'm super happy to see that. Once More to the Void has several original mini games, which I really like, because a lot of the Firebrand framework games use similar, if not the same, mini games, which is perfectly awesome, right? Because these games are so good that they slot into different premises really easily. But I really wanted to go all out with the sci fi tropes. <laughs> so I really made different mini games that were like focused on each trope. So we have the recruitment montage when you get the crew together, right? So that's what you always start with. And just like old times, it's a battle to prove ourselves against the enemy. Only one shot to make it right is a training montage, because of course we need a training montage. In Mass Effect 2, there was a really super quick one that should have been longer. But anyway, so so I made an entire game based on that. Then blowing off steam is a night out with the crew. So fun. And then there's Who Do You Think You Are, which is like a confrontation. So this is like in Mass Effect 2, when you always have two characters, like butt heads, like Jack and Miranda or something. That's what sets that off. And then the last time we touch, which is Possible Intimacy. It's a very intimate game that I really enjoy. So this is definitely based on stealing time together from the original game. And then... 
I never did trust you, which is like a really intense one. This is like, it's possible that one of you may end up dying or betraying the entire crew by the end of it. So I even put in like a little tag saying like, if you don't want this to be on the table, then just take the game off. So I've had a few people who did that, right? And they appreciated having the conversation beforehand because it is an emotionally intense game and you kind of want to know ahead of time of, okay, things are intense, but do we actually want the possibility of betrayal or not? And then next is only if you have the time captain, which is based on all the awesome loyalty missions that you can do in Mass Effect. But it's really fun in a TTRPG because you get to like really have those moments breathe. It's an opportunity for the captain to like go out of their way to really help a crew member to help one of their companions and help them with something. Just like (laughs) in the video games, it's that time where you're going, I'm going to do all these things to do my completion points before I go on to the end of the thing. So you're doing those those loyalty missions for all the people to, so you get the most, bring the most story out of the. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So it's, it's one of the longer mini games, but I really like it. And then the final game is Once More Into the Void, because I'm a little dramatic, and the last mini game is the same title of the game. So this is the final mission, where the stakes are really high, and throughout the whole game, right, so at the end of each mini game, there's a little mechanic called the loyalty draw, where you draw a card from a deck, and you see how much loyalty that you gain from the scene. And so that can be really interesting, because you can think you had a really strong moment together and then you draw the card and sometimes it's like one token of loyalty it was really interesting for people to say as they think through the scene they're like yeah you know captain even though you said those things to me you didn't earn a lot of my loyalty because you said those things before and you still let me down so it created this like new layer of nuance or sometimes there would be a scene where people didn't really connect but there was a lot of loyalty gained and so people would come up with great narrative explanations for it. So basically, those loyalty tokens matter in the last mission in Once More Into the Void because you can only pass these challenges if you have enough tokens to pay for each one. So it's really a nail-biting, super intense time. Every time I've playtested and did this one, so far, I've been lucky. We're like, maybe only one person dies. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's right it was sherry who died in, in our play test oh my god yes uh it was it was but she intense. sacrificed herself so sorry. yeah yeah that's really really enjoyable and uh, i'm just so glad that people responded well to the game because i first released it on itch like i said in, in a few state across eight days so i really don't recommend that for most people when it first came out, I spent all this time and energy, but the actual amount of money I spent on the game was zero dollars because I did all the layout, the graphics. I spent like hours on pixabay.com looking for sci-fi art. And even in that zero dollar state, a lot of people really enjoyed the PDF and could really oh, yeah. see the potential in the game. And I released this shortly before the Panini happened, uh, before the end time. So... It actually got to a few cons, so that was really good. Uh, a lot of people were asking for a print-friendly version, and then they suddenly didn't need it anymore because we were no longer <laughs> playing in person. <laughs> but the end is in sight, so now we have a Kickstarter where you can get a physical version. Like all of my games on Itch, I continue to work on all of them and play test all of them. So Once More Into the Void was definitely... One of my favorites, if I'm allowed to pick favorites. But the thing is, being from the Philippines, I don't have direct access to Kickstarter. Like, there's actually a very small number of countries that have access to Kickstarter. And even if I wanted to do it locally, we don't have that much of a local market here for TTRPGs. Like, Mm -hmm. I don't think we even, I don't think it even goes into the hundreds. So it's a very small group, you know, for indie games at any rate. For D&D, that's a different thing. Right. We also don't have much options for printing compared to like what I've seen in the States and in other countries. It's really, you're going to have to make a print run like of a few thousand copies to even get started. So it's really like super daunting. I had just given up on the idea of making any of my games physical, basically. I was just like, they will just exist in PDF land (laughs) on itch.io. 
So I was really happy when Jason Pitt of Legend of Genesis of Publishing came across my game and he loved it so much. He did this really amazing Twitter thread about it and he reached out to me to talk about how much he loved the game and I was so moved. And Jason's been working in the indie publishing scene for a while. Like he's also like a one man job from concept to writing to design to layout to publishing he does every single step of that for his games and so he reached out to me and proposed a partnership between sword queen games between me and legend of genesis publishing and we've been working on it for the last few months in secret scheming together and jason handled all of the logistical kickstarter stuff all the stuff that scared me that i was really nervous about he's been really great In fact, one of the biggest things that he suggested that I loved was we would get illustrators from Southeast Asia. So I got two illustrators from the Philippines. And he said to make sure that the art flows well in the book, to have a color palette that's the same between the cover Mm -hmm. and the interior illustrations. And Jason was like, you know, this is just a suggestion, but the bisexual flag has really great colors. And I was like, oh, that is correct. I'm doing the art direction for Once More Into the Void. And so I had already started working with Adrian Valdez on the cover. And I realized I had already suggested bisexual colors for the characters. I was like, it's a sign. It's a sign that we should go forth and do this. So we've really been in sync. I've been having such a great time working with Jason. It's been such a great opportunity. I've met Jason at Mm. Metatopia and at Origins and always been incredibly nice to me Mm. and just good person. Like a person that you meet and you're like, oh, this is a good human being. I like him a lot. He's really, really sweet. Really nice. He was worried that I would get overwhelmed by the Kickstarter stuff, especially because of my brain health stuff. So he's been very, very supportive and very, very sweet the entire time. I'm really so lucky to have so many people in the community who are so supportive and helpful, but especially grateful for Jason and this opportunity. So basically, funds from the Kickstarter will cover the cost of development of the game up to this point. Like It was very important to Jason that... I get compensation for the work and energy I've put in so far, because even though I spent zero dollars, I spent, (laughs) I spent the dollars of my body and my time. Yes. Um, Eight days, eight days of (laughs) 20 hours. Yeah. 20 hour days just on this game and and all the hours of playtesting after and stuff. And also it's going to cover gorgeous illustrations from Filipino artists. I'm so happy to be able to work with Adrian Valdez and Camille Chua. They've been really amazing. Those two. I really love the art. And it's also going to cover a print run of hardcover books, which is so wild. Like these really gorgeous square format books. We have some mock-ups on the Kickstarter. They look amazing. And I can also finally work with an editor. I haven't worked with an editor yet. Uh, It's just been me reading the game over and over again, still finding typos every so often because that's how it is. I'm getting my partner to take a look and then we still have typos because that's how it is. And also I'll be able to work with a game development consultant. So that's really, really exciting. I can't wait for that. And with stretch goals, we can expand the content of the game a little bit and really bring it to its final form and really refining the game to a wonderful polish, which I'm super, super excited about. And it funded. Let's not (laughs) be around the bush here. But we buried the lead. I'm sure everyone who's listening knows this already, but (laughs) it funded fast. And so where are you at with that right now? I was so shocked. We funded in eight hours. And we hit our first stretch goal within the first day. So as of this recording, we're close to hitting our second stretch goal. I have a good feeling we're going to hit it. It should have been our final one. And we're keeping the stretch goals really simple, keeping the Kickstarter small, which I appreciate. But with the surprise success of the Kickstarter, like how well it's doing, we may add just a little bit more. Jason and I have been talking about a few extra goodies in the book, mainly because... Once More Into the Void is great for two-shot play, like recruitment montage, the first set of games, and then another set of mini-game choices, and then you go Once More Into the Void. So it's great across two sessions, but I'm working on making it better for one-shot play, and I'm working on if you want to make it four sessions or longer. Hmm. I came across one group recently. They took four hours for just the recruitment montage, which was really... Oh my gosh. They really went all out of the role-playing. I don't recommend that all the time, but I'm glad they did it. That was super fun. 
yeah, the little goodies will help like if you want to run a longer campaign or if you want to hack it a bit. What I'm hoping most for the Kickstarter with the success I'm really grateful for is that it'll mean more publishers, especially indie ones, will want to work with folks like me who can't access Kickstarter directly. Jason was actually talking about the first time he got a game on Kickstarter. It was a similar thing because Canada didn't have access to Kickstarter yet. So it was a an American partner that worked with him in order to get his first game out there. And I'm hoping that more people will like hack Firebrands. Uh, we've been getting a few comments about, oh, this game is really great. I can see how this would work in a fantasy setting. I'm like, yeah, go for it. Just, yes. just hack it, please. Uh, on the Gauntlet, we've had this really great Doctor Who hack that is super fun. So I really recommend it. I'm hoping that's what's going to happen at the end of the Kickstarter that we'll just see more Firebrand hacks in the wild. I'm just so pleased and excited that this is happening. Yes, I, it was a great <laughs> game. First time I played it, opened my eyes to what Firebrands could do. It's so strong because we all know and love those kinds of stories. And, mm-hmm. and your questions and your suggestions and your picks on everything are so full of possibility that everyone's going to have this completely different game. Yeah. It's so lovely. Yeah, because depending on how you answer the questions and how you want to interpret the emotional themes of each playbook, it's such a different experience each time even when i played even when i picked the same playbook depending on what the other characters are doing so it's super wild i love it so much awesome so good thank you jammy for that awesome rundown on the kickstarter i know it's gonna be (laughs) fabulous let's go into our third segment and that is giving me life so lol what's currently giving you life I've actually been listening to an audiobook called Can't Slow Down by Michelangelo Matos. And it is a history of pop music in 1984. Just that Whoa, year. Wow. 1984. Okay. Which I is that up. Yeah. the year of Thriller, the year of Madonna, CZ Top. There's a sea change in terms of hard rock. And we get Van Halen. Mm-hmm. And all of these sort of real classic bands, and it's talking about some of the behind the scenes stuff, stuff about the way that black artists were pushed off of radio and MTV's pushing off and how this is a year that really changed some of those things and the change in instrumentation wow. and things. Mm-hmm. And of course, 1984 is, let me see here, that's like first year of high school for me. Oh, so, yeah. So it's really like real foundational yeah, yeah, stuff. Yeah, amazing. And I'm digging it. I love these kinds of thick reads of a particular period of arts and entertainment. So that's what's giving me life. And Jimmy, how about you? I recently picked up as a treat for myself a new tarot deck. I used to be a full time professional tarot reader. So. I do tend to have a lot of decks, but they move around a lot. I want to defend myself, right? Like <laughs> I, I give away decks and then new decks find their way to me. So, but I decided to buy this gorgeous one. I've seen Lowell use it. It's so good. Oh, it's, it's so nice. Yeah. The Tarot of the Divine by Yoshi Yoshitani. And it's so good because it's inspired by deities, folklore, and fairy tales from all around the world. I love how diverse it is. I love the choices. It's so good. Like the lovers as Beauty and the Beast is like really perfect. Mm -hmm. There's even like a Filipino god that's in there that we don't even talk about here anymore because colonization. But anyway, it was great to see it (laughs) in the card. I loved it so much. The art is like really bright and graphic Mm -hmm. and it really draws you in. And as a tarot reader, the card quality is amazing. Like that's that's what I love to geek out about because it's like thicker then most cards, you know, if you drop water on it or something, like, can happen sometimes when you read at a coffee shop. Like, nothing will happen. Like, you'll just wipe it off and it's fine. Compared to other cheaper card socks that go, oh, and yeah. just suck up all that water and are just ruined forever. Uh, anyway, it's a gorgeous deck. The production quality is also amazing. I love working with it so much. I've been using it, like, every day. It's really, oh, really... Great. It's been helping me with the Kickstarter stuff and all the other things. Awesome. So it's really, really great. I love this deck so much. And I highly recommend it for anyone who's interested in tarot. And I can see how it would be really great for TTRPGs that are that use a tarot deck. It would be fantastic, mm-hmm. I think. Okay. And for me, what's been giving me life lately is that... 
Rich Rogers brought up uh, Forged of the Dark Games that he's looking at lately and, and was talking with me about him and it got me thinking about the game that I kind of been working on odd and off. Ooh. But even more so, it's gotten me excited about the other Forge in the Dark games that I've been playtesting. Again, mm-hmm. like Sam Zimmerman's Hunter's Code. And of course, I've been playing Brinkwood. And it's like that kind of thing of going, I don't know why, but it has that kind of careful set of mechanics that you put together and it gives you an experience and at work I am completely overworked right now I have four major things but I have this little thing where I can sneak off and think about just a little bit of a part of the game and I've been thinking of sometimes think about my game sometimes I'm thinking about one of these other fabulous Forge of the Dark games and it really is just that little bite-sized bit of thought about a thing that is keeping me going and keeping me thrilled about the chance of playing and designing awesome listeners that's our show the gauntlet podcast is a production of the gauntlet we have an online gaming calendar the gauntlet calendar where folks can sign up for our sessions if you've enjoyed this show please consider supporting our patreon at patreon.com slash gauntlet that supports everything we do including our network of podcasts and our magazine codex You can find out more about all of that at gauntlet-rpg.com. You can also reach us on Twitter at gauntletrpg or on Facebook at the gauntlet.rpg group. Thank you. I want to throw something in here before we go on. Uh, Listeners, also, we have Gauntlet Community Open Gaming Weekend coming up at the end of June. Registration for events is going to start at the beginning of June, and there's information for that also on that website. Excellent. Thank you. And Lowell, thank you for joining me. Woohoo. And Jamie, it is so good to talk to you about this project. I'm so excited yeah. for you. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm so happy to be here. And a last teaser Ooh. before we let everyone go. <laughs> Next episode <gasps> is episode 200 <gasps> of the Gauntlet Podcast. That's and exciting. We're, we're planning something special for that. 200. 200 amazing (laughs) amazing i'm so happy for the goddess podcast and i'm so excited yeah can't wait